thank you very much. Um, first of all, hello everybody. Thank you so much for coming along. It's really nice to see all the messages coming through. I think there's somebody with a birthday, so happy birthday to you. Um, I'm here today to talk about Seahorse Trust. Um, I'm a trustee for the Trust, but I've also been working with them for the last 10 years. And I started with them as a survey diver working at our research site down in Studland, which we're going to talk about today. And after that, I slowly became their education board. So I work in uh, marine conservation education. That's what I do as a job. Um, and I do a lot of the um, education stuff for the trust as well, including the social media, all that sort of thing. So we are a very tiny trust. There is just one employee. So we are really, really small. So we are very reliant on volunteers and people that get engaged with the work that we do. Uh, one of whom I know is in here because she just said hello. So hello. Um, Great that everybody's here. And um, do you want me to make a start straight away, Dan? Yeah, um, go for it. Uh, we have got a poll. Um, if you want to uh, see where people have come from, should we do that quickly? Yeah, that would be brilliant. Yeah, rock on. So um, just what describes you um, as a participant? So we'll whack that up. Uh, we'll give it oh, 15 seconds. Um, chuck in your answer, guys. It's all anonymous. We're not going to know who you are. We're not going to hunt you down or anything like that. Um, just a nice gauge of who we've got as a um, group of participants today. There we are. It's working. Someone's someone's answered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that flying up. Super. Incredible. God, you guys are snappy as well. Um, like just that. to let you know, there's two questions there. The second one says div, choice one, choice two. It means that Not people bad. have to select that to submit their answer. That's really weird. Uh, it, it looks like a mistake that's been added in. So don't worry, just select anything for the second question. It means nothing, guys. <laughs> <laughs> just a bit of gibberish in there. Yeah, just to keep you on your toes. Awesome. Um, we'll give it oh, five seconds and then we'll stop there. Uh, amazing. And stop. Let's share some results, guys. Oh, so we've got loads of general naturalists. So 49% have identified as a general naturalist. Um, Massive are loads of seahorse enthusiasts, got 88 people. Um, and we've got a few divers in there just to mix it up a little bit, some students, 13%. And we've got other marine professionals as well. So 3% have identified as that as well. And uh, a beautiful 5% for marine conservation professionals. So there we are. I'll uh, hand that all over to you. That's great. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Thanks for that. It's good to see where everyone comes from. Um, it's just interesting to know, really. It's, um, it's quite... Um, incredible how seahorses capture the imagination of a lot of people from lots and lots of different backgrounds. Um, so that's brilliant. So shall I crack on with the presentation? Yeah, go for it. Brilliant. So I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. Um, it will let me do that. Okay. There we go. Wonders of magic. Is that all there for you? Beautiful. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I should take that down. Okay, so um, the Seahorse Trust. So as I say, we're an absolute tiny um, charity, but we have a massive impact, especially in the world of seahorses, um, but also for all sorts of different species. We use seahorses really as a species, um, that, as a flagship species for the rest of the marine conservation world. It doesn't mean that we ignore other species. We don't, we try and work with all of them. Um, and we always try and work with other people as well and work in partnership where we can. We are based in the UK, but we do work all the way around the world and um, with lots and lots of different partner organisations. Um, so we've been working for over 20 years um, and basically within that 20 years, we've discovered that seahorses in the UK are breeding, which means that they live here. They're a breeding species, so they are native to the UK, whereas originally it was believed that seahorses sort of came over to the UK as a little bit of a visit and disappeared again. And we've changed all that way of thinking due to the research that we've done. We also host um, the World Seahorse Database, which has got records from all over the world, the UK, Malta. Um, I think I saw somebody in the chat with Thailand. And um, we've got all sorts of recordings from all over the world. And we encourage any sightings to be sent through to us um, just to help us develop our knowledge of seahorse species. Whilst we know quite a bit, we really don't know as much as we'd like to know. Um, and that, that does cause some conflicts in terms of conservation work and protection, because if we can only imply what we know, um, so it would be much better to get as much data as we possibly can. 
Um, and I think there's some social media links that might be coming up um, into the chat so that you know where to find us. Um, so we're going to first of all have a look at the two species around the UK, as that's where we're talking from today. By the way, if you hear any strange noises, it's my dog. <laughs> He's uh, just decided to wake up, which is unusual. Um, so first of all, two species we're going to look at. Um, this is the short-snouted seahorse. Um, it's quite a stocky little seahorse for the two that we have, and it's found all around the UK. Um, you can see them on the map. We've got um, lots of different species. Um, these are not pinpointed um, uh, dots on the map that are joined together. We have to be quite loose as to where they are because of their level of protection so that we don't give away exactly where they're found. Um, but basically, um, we've discovered that the short-snouted seahorses within UK waters prefer sort of um, habitats with low vegetation. It's quite rocky with rough sediment. So where you sometimes may not expect to find a seahorse, that's where we tend to find short-snouteds. Um, they also quite like harbours and places like that. So anywhere with really, really um, low amounts of vegetation. Um, so these um, points that we have on the map actually come from sightings that have been sent through to us, as well as our own research. And it just shows how important it is, for the information that comes through to us when people um, tell us what species they found, where it is, if they've got a photo, it tells us a thousand words about that species. We can also tell whether it's male or female. Um, so those, that's a little bit about those ones. We've also got the ones you may be more familiar with because we tend to get them a lot more um, on media. Um, so these are the spiny seahorse and they're generally a slightly larger seahorse and they have a preference for vegetated habitats. In the UK that means um, seagrass beds tends to be where we find them um, and they tend to be distributed in slightly different places. So if you look at that map compared to the previous one, they are slightly different because the habitats obviously change. Um, these ones are incredible and seahorses grow as they get older and older and older. Um, and the largest um, spiny seahorse that's ever been found in the UK so far, you never know, I find a bigger one, um, was a 30 centimetre individual. And it was found by a harbour fisherman. We get a lot of sightings coming in from fishermen, which is brilliant because we get to learn a lot about their distribution into sort of deeper waters. Um, so that hopefully will come up in the chat, but if it doesn't, if you have a look on YouTube for biggest British seahorse, it will come up and you can see a little bit more about that. Um, so the greatest issue for seahorses in the UK and around the world is the fact that they live in coastal waters, which is where they come into direct conflict with humans. And although we are generally very lovely, uh, we don't normally notice what's going on under the water. So we're going to talk a little bit first about seahorses and how incredible they actually are. Um, they are beautiful. We know that people look at them and think they're really special, but they are very special in the um, way that they have evolved. So hairy seahorses, it's not actually hair, but if you have a look um, at the seahorses, you can see they have these appendages coming off all around their bodies. These are actually fleshy skin filaments that grow from the body. Um, and they can grow and they can be absorbed over long periods of time. It depends on the habitat that they're in. So we tend to find um, from the research we've done that young spiny seahorses tend to be more hairy than the older ones. And basically as they grow older, they need um, a little less camouflage so they can absorb those appendages. Um, and they can adapt better to those situations. Um, so, We've got over on this picture here on the left, we've got um, two spiny seahorses. Um, so you can see um, sort of all the appendages on them. One thing we do find, um, which is why we've got the other um, image, is that when seahorses are found in different areas of Europe, they look different. So the spiny seahorse in the UK looks with all these lovely, wonderful appendages. And the short snouted seahorse doesn't really have very many, but when you go into Mediterranean waters, the short snouted seahorse has lots of appendages. It all depends on the habitats that they're in. Colour change is a fascinating thing which seahorses are able to do, and they can do it in two different ways. Um, and this is all due to something called chromatophores, which lie underneath the skin, and they're changed by um, hormonal um, influence. So we have two different ways. So the first one, we have um, the white seahorse there with a very, very distinct black outline. Um, this um, seahorse here, behind it, what looks like a shadow is actually another seahorse, um, and they are about to do their mating dance. So the black outline that's on them, those raised black dots, 
are there to say, hello, I'm here, come and mate with me. Um, so that's a very, very quick color change that happens. Whereas if you look in the picture opposite, you're, if you're very good at eyesight, you'll spot there's two seahorses hiding in that detritus on the seabed. Um, and that's a slow releasing change to the skin color to allow them to blend into their habitat. There's two reasons why seahorses need to blend in. One, they're actually prey. Things do eat them, even though they are really bony and crunchy, um, especially things like rays. They really do like seahorses. Um, but also because they're voracious predators, they continuously feed all day long on mice and shrimp. And for that, they need to be able um, to hide nicely. Also for that feeding, they need exceptional eyesight and their eyes are incredible. Um, they can look two different directions at the same time, a bit like a chameleon. They see in full color and they can almost see in pitch blackness from the research that's been done. There is some further research that's been done at the moment that we're really quite excited um, to see the outcomes of. Um, and that's really looking into how sensitive their eyes are. Um, their eyes, as I say, are highly movable. They've got nearly 360 vision. Um, and one of the things that this allows is that they can distinguish their prey in very, very low, low light levels, which for some species is ideal because they live in um, darker areas. Those shorts now to see horses in the, you know, the harbors, it's gonna be darker in there compared to a seagrass bed, those sorts of things. Um, so we're really interested in that sort of research. The Seahorse Trust advocate for the use of no flash or bright light on seahorses when they are photographed. This being the reason that they have highly sensitive eyes. Um, if you imagine a flash going off in your face, it's really unpleasant. If you're a seahorse or any marine creature really that isn't used to that bright light, it can have an effect on you. Um, one thing we've learned about seahorses over the years is that they take really badly to increase light um, over periods of time. So you will notice that if you ever go to an aquarium and you see the seahorse tank, it's covered in little signs that say, do not use flash photography. The reason being that if there's a whole load of flash that's taken, you lose most of the species in that tank, most of the individuals, they will die through stress, unfortunately. Seahorses are really good at getting stressed out. Um, it's a really bad thing. Um, but like all of us, if we become stressed, our immune systems weaken and any disease that we may have will be heightened. And in the case of seahorses, in their blood, there are diseases like fibrio and that just takes over and unfortunately could lead to their death. Um, so we do strongly advocate for, you know, if you do take a photo of a seahorse, please never use um, flash or strong lights. Seahorses are absolutely rubbish swimmers. <laughs> They're not very good at all. Um, all they've got is that pectoral fin on the back and um, you know that's not overly powerful. So when they are in the coastal waters, you've got to imagine it can be quite swishy and swayy. There's lots of currents. So they need something that's gonna hold them onto something. And that's a prehensile tail. It's extremely strong. Um, sometimes you see in pictures, a seahorse drawn as like an S shape which is actually physically impossible due to the little, um, the bones and the cartilage, the way that they're connected. Um, so they actually curl inwards. And you can see from those pictures there how strong it is. And in those pictures, you can see the big bellies. These are males and they are heavily pregnant. Um, the one to the left um, is, they're both spinies, but the one to the left, you can see the sort of a dark green color towards um, around his belly. And that shows actually he's extremely heavily pregnant. Um, and not long off actually going to be giving birth. Which brings us on to the fact they're super dads. So seahorses are the only, um, the only ones where the male is the one that gets pregnant. And it is a true pregnancy. The eggs do embed into the lining of the pouch um, and they are grown with the support of the dad. So it is a true pregnancy. Um, here we've got um, a picture of a dad, the same one from Studland Bay. Um, he's about three, four years old. Um, you can see that dark green color to his tummy um, and the, his fry were actually born about three, four days later. But the little fry in the picture, although it'd be lovely to have some photos of fry being born in the wild, we don't have that. These ones are actually um, taken from a tank, but you can see how tiny they are. Um, this dad probably gave birth between four to 500 um, baby seahorses, which you can kind of feel his pain. Um, that's so good, but some seahorse species actually give up to about a thousand fry. 
um, so which is an awful lot. Um, so most of these fry, the idea is that because they're so small, they go up into the plankton, the majority of them will be eaten um, and only some will survive. We know that the study site that we have at Studland, some of these fry are actually settling back out into the seagrass bed. Um, the smallest seahorse we've ever found was a four uh, centimetre tall one um, back in 2010. So you can imagine how small that seahorse was. And it's incredible the diver who spotted it found it, which was actually our director, Neil, um, because the visibility was actually down to about 30 centimetres that day. So um, it's incredible he even came across it. So talk about Studland. Um, don't know if you've ever been, but if you haven't, it's an absolutely stunning place. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, it's a honeypot site, so we get hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. People that come to just enjoy it, people bring their boats, kayaks, they might swim, they might just sit at the beach, all those different things. Now, both species have been found at the site. We only know it um, as a breeding site for spiny seahorse. We don't know it as one for short snouteds. Um, and for that reason, we have it as our research site for spiny seahorse. Um, it's been recently designated as a marine conservation zone and at the moment um, all the major stakeholders are meeting regularly in order to put in conservation measures to protect the site. It's not just for seahorses, there are other species on that um, marine conservation zone designation as well. Um, so the most boats that we've ever counted in a day is 350, um, which is quite impressive if you ever go there and experience it. We tend to dive very early in the morning when we go into our surveys and it's quite incredible. You can go under the water and there's about three maybe four boats around um, and then by the time you come out from the survey you are absolutely surrounded by them and it's people just enjoying themselves having a great time. Nobody has a problem with that. The issue is when it comes into conflict um, with the health of the seagrass bed itself. So the research that we've done, as I say, we've been at it for about 20 years. Um, Neil, our director, has actually been involved with seahorses for around 46 years. He started off as an aquarist um, and was one of the first people who managed to get seahorses to breed in tanks because they are notoriously difficult. So he has a very um, diverse understanding of the species, both in aqua aquaria, but also in the wild. And as you can imagine, there are quite a few differences between behaviour and all those sorts of different aspects between the two. So over the last um, 20 years, we've discovered um, the breeding seahorses have actually got territorial behaviour with a male and a female. The female tends to have a larger area than the male um, and, you know, they overlap because they come together. If there is um, some kind of storm event or something that comes along that makes them move, they will try to come back to the original um, territory and the pair will actually stick together wherever they get moved to. So they are loyal to each other. They're not monogamous, we've discovered, especially for the, well, for the spiny seahorse anyway. They will be monogamous for a season, for a breeding season, say from um, April through to October, but the following year they'll breed possibly the same one again, but they might breed with a different one. Um, so that moves us on to mating strategies. So that's what we found for UK seahorses. We've also been involved in research in different um, countries, including the seahorse you can see here, which is actually a hedgehog seahorse, which is found in Cambodia. And the research that's been done on those has discovered that they're polygamous. So they will actually just breed with any seahorse. They're not bothered. Um, and it's generally because they'll actually attach themselves to urchins um, by way of um, ensuring their own protection. And as they move around, they'll come across other males and females and they just breed with each other. Um, completely different strategy, but works for them. We've also managed to work out habitat preferences for the species in the UK, which we mentioned at the start. Population size is um, a bit of a unknown around the UK in terms of the whole population. At our study site, the most we've ever had was 46. The worst we've ever had is none. Um, and that happened for about three years in a row. Um, so numbers do fluctuate quite a lot, whether that's due to pressures, changes, we're not 100% sure, but they do seem to be um, indicating that it's due to human pressure. During um, lockdowns, we suddenly had a massive population back again. Um, so all those sorts of things are coming together at the moment. Um, and obviously through the work that we do, we found out a lot about different pressures and different threats. Um, and that's both in the UK and abroad. Um, 
But first of all, there's one thing that I really must um, ensure that I mention, and that's through the legalities of Seahorse Re Research in the UK. We are covered under license at the Seahorse Trust, and we advocated for licensing to come in when we um, put forward both species to be protected um, in the UK because they originally weren't because they weren't believed to be breeding here. Um, through that licensing, it's done through the uh, MMO. Um, every single year we have to reapply for that licensing and adhere to strict conditions as to how we carry out our research, um, those sorts of things. And if you are interested in seahorse research, um, we obviously do collaborate with different people, but we also hold um, courses on that, um, which I'll mention later on. Um, but please be aware that in the UK, it is illegal to sit, seek a seahorse. So if you go with the intention of trying to find a seahorse in UK waters and you haven't got a license, you are actually breaking the law. Um, and that's just because of protection of the species. Um, so it's just to make you aware because we know that some of these things do happen. Um, and sadly, one of the pressures at Studland has become divers and snorkelers because the site has become so popular with people knowing that spiny seahorses are found there, that we have seen an increase. And um, we've even had um, dive clubs actually advertising seahorse visits, and we've had to um, intervene on those. Um, so it's, um, you've got to be very, very careful how you do these different things. And please be aware that a lot of this regulation is the same in all European countries. So there are rules out there. So just be make sure you please make sure you're always on the right side um, of the rules. However, it is possible that you go out for a dive or a snorkel, even a swim. Um, actually, even paddle boarding, because one of our volunteers um, recently past summer was paddle boarding at, at Studland and the seahorse swam past her paddleboard. <laughs> um, so these things do happen. But if you can get a photo um, of them from wherever you are and you put information on the location, then that would be great if you could submit that to us. It just gives us a bit of a picture about what's going on um, with different species. So because this concern of ours to do with um, seahorses and divers and snorkelers is a real one, but by all means, we don't want to stop people enjoying those interactions. Um, we just last year decided that we needed to get the message out there because it tends to be people don't understand how to interact with a seahorse because they are tricky, unfortunately. Um, and so we actually um, did a, um, a sort of campaign that we started last summer. We're going to run it again this summer and it's called hashtag happy seahorse. And it's just basically to say, here's a happy seahorse, here's a not so happy seahorse. Um, and what to do if you see one or the other. Um, so would you mind please very quickly, um, don't know if you could do it, how best with the way to do it, Dan. Oh, thank you, brilliant. Can you please choose A or B um, to which one you think is showing the signs of stress? And I went quick word. I'm just going to say that A looks like me when uh, yeah. we're having a, a sofa Sunday day. <laughs> it's doing very well. <laughs> this is great. Fantastic. Um, That's great. We'll yeah, yeah, we'll end it there. That's super. Um, so, yeah, do you want to take this over, Becky? Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. So, yes, you've all got it. Brilliant. A is the stressed seahorse. Um, so, it's um, there are some clear signs in this one to notice how you can tell when the seahorse is stressed. If it's relaxed and calm, it tends to be upright. It'll look at you, it'll be interested. The first time I met a seahorse, I had to stay still for a very long time because it decided to come and have a look in my mask and then attach itself to um, my air hose. Um, so I had to stay for a very long time. But they will come over, investigate you. They'll look at you. They'll be bright. They'll appear you know, quite upright. However, if they become stressed, and it don't necessarily mean it's caused by the person that's come along. It could be by any environmental condition that's affected them during um, that day or week or whatever they will start to darken, their skin will darken, their head will start to tuck in, they're trying to make themselves look smaller, they'll curl up, they'll start to lie down towards the seabed. Um, they might even decide to turn around and swim away. If they swim away, please don't chase them, just let them go um, and they'll just leave and carry on. 
but if you do see these changes please do um obviously adhere to them and just move away and leave the source uh, the seahorse alone we have that as one of our rules we sit and observe a seahorse before we go to take um any information or photographs or anything and if we see the change we just leave them and we don't record anything about them um so you know it's one of the, those things but please if you do see our hashtag happy seahorse the campaign going on during the um during the summer please share it and please spread the word about it because we want everyone to get the chance to see these incredible creatures in the safest way possible for both so we've mentioned already a bit about um seahorse habitats so seagrass beds are beautiful if you ever get chance to go in one they're fascinating there's so much to see in them they're amazing especially the anemones which creep up the um, seagrass blades, absolutely amazing. But this is a healthy seagrass. This is what it should look like. Um, sadly, this is what we see a lot of it looking like, which is direct um, damage. So it can be from anchor damage, um, where anchors are put straight into the seagrass, then pulled back out, which pulls all the roots and the rhizomes to the surface, makes the sediment very unstable. Um, or chain drag um, or scour, which can come from anchor chains or it can come from mooring boys and it just rubs and rubs and rubs and rubs at the seabed and removes the seagrass, making it quite unstable. Um, so that obviously isn't an ideal situation and it's not just seahorses, it's lots of other species. Um, and then, you know, after a period of time, there won't be any seagrass there anymore and it takes a very, very long time for it to actually grow back. So you can actually see this when you look down on it. So this is um, Isles of Scilly. And you can see here the circles or the slight, you know, look quite circular. Some of these are from anchors, some of these are from mooring chains. Um, so there is an issue with scour, obviously. It shouldn't look like this. So there has to be a solution. And there is one. And that's using eco moorings. So traditional mooring, you can see there A. So you've got um, an anchor block on the bed. You've got a chain going across and then a line going up to a float. As the tide goes out, more chain goes on the bed and then scours round. And that's what the problem is. So there are two ways to deal with this. One of them is to change um, the chain itself that goes to the float, and you can make that into an elastic um, riser, or you can use the chain, but you just put floats on it, so it keeps it up in the water column. Um, so we've been um, advocating for this for a very, very long time, and last year was our best year ever because we managed to team up with boat folk. Brilliant people, absolutely fantastic. They heard about this that we were looking to do and they got on board straight away. Absolutely brilliant. So they helped um, fund putting in um, eco moorings. We put 10 eco moorings in at Stedland. Um, some, of the other, some of the moorings were supported by them. Some of them were supported by other people. Um, but we were able to put these 10 eco moorings in to test them, to see if they are working um, and the impact that's actually been had on the seabed. Um, so that's actually being researched by the University of Portsmouth, so that has been monitored so we can actually see the change over time. Um, so this is what they look like. So you can see there the mooring buoy um, and the, the riser there going down um, to the floats and the helical screw and the elastic road. So it's all on there. That's how we've been putting it together and we are working with other people to create more. We've currently got, I think it's another possibly eight, nine, maybe more that have been completely paid for by individuals and businesses ready for next year, well, for this year to go in this season. Um, and we're also talking about putting them in at other sites, depending on you know, interest. And this has kind of blown up. There's lots of people looking at this now, which is fantastic. The more we can get in, the better. So if you see any projects supporting these, including ours, please, please do support them. Um, so we know they're working. Apparently there are queues to get onto our mooring boys at the moment in Sutherland. Um, we actually had complaints from people saying you haven't put enough in, can you put more in because we want to use them, we don't want to use the old ones. So we know that this really works and that people are really understanding the differences um, and are getting this to go along. So Boat Folk, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, they um, own a range of different heart, um, marinas around the UK. And they also said to us that they're aware that seahorses like to use marinas, but there's obviously a conflict there too. And there's lots of other species that go into marinas. So was there a way to actually get around this? 
So we um, collaborated with them and also with the University of Portsmouth again, and they designed um, bio huts. And the idea is that these are put in to create biodiverse environments, artificial ones, which is what a harbour is anyway, but they are quite effective and they're effective for lots and lots of um, different species, particularly um, short snouted seahorses. So these were created last summer and they were deployed. Um, so here's one in the water. Um, there is a live stream that they're currently trying to fix. And um, so hopefully sometime soon you'll be able to see all the fish coming up to it and what other species have colonized them. So they're monitoring them to see what species come in, how long it takes to change, all those sorts of things. Um, so it's a solution and other harbors and marinas are looking at them as something that they might want to put in as well to see what goes on and um, to create new habitats. So um, the idea is we're safeguarding natural habitats, we're providing artificial habitats, so the world of seahorses should be brilliant. Unfortunately not. There is one other threat that is absolutely worldwide, including the UK, and massive. And that's curios and traditional medicine. Unfortunately, seahorses are ground down. It is believed that they give some kind of property to make you um, better in bed, I believe. Um, but personally, I haven't seen any research to prove that there is actually anything that would do that. Um, so they're used in traditional medicine. They're also used for curios. So people like to buy seahorses as a memento of their stay at the beach. Some people do that inadvertently, not realizing that they have a real seahorse. Um, I don't know if you've seen them, but for a while there were these little um, resin paperweights and they had dried seahorses in them because they were cheaper than putting plastic ones in, um, which sounds horrendous, really. A live creature should not cost more than something plastic, it would cost less than something plastic. They also had ones with beetles and bugs and all sorts of things. Um, so it is a massive, massive issue. And to buy seahorses in the, the dried form, you should have paperwork from CITES. They are protected under CITES. Um, and the threat was originally believed to about 5 million seahorses taken a year. There was an investigation undertaken by Save Our Seahorses um, in Ireland. And there's a program on Eden, and I believe you can still get access to it. Um, and basically they went undercover to see how bad this trade actually is. The 5 million wasn't even close. It was closer to 150 million seahorses a year. Um, and if that continues, seahorses, some species could become what we call functionally extinct, which means that they're no longer um, available in the wild. Um, there have been some um, projects to try and bring things like um, aquaculture tanks to try and breed seahorses that way. Um, but we, we don't know what's going to happen. The ones in this photo, you may think are from not from the UK, unfortunately they are, they're from Brixham. Um, we've had, um, over the last three years, four years really, and we've been having a lot of reports of um, little seaside shops selling dead seahorses. Um, so we have a very close collaboration with the police. Um, we reported it, it was reported to us, we then reported it to the police. It's their uh, jurisdiction, they went in and um, raided and they found bags and bags and bags of dead seahorses for sale. And they also found crocodiles, lowfish, turtles, um, and the owner's excuse was, well, I could buy it off the internet, so therefore it must be legal. Like that. I can do that. Um, that's not an excuse, and they were fined, um, but was that fine big enough for all those seahorses or, and all those other species? I don't know. That's a question someone to ask. Um, so how do we actually stop this? Well, there's enforcement, but really the key to everything is education. If people understand, they take ownership of things, they take responsibility, and they want to look after things. That's what we do. Um, so it's the same with, you know, knowing the best way to understand when a seahorse gets stressed. You know, it's just knowledge. It's just sending those different things. So we have lots of different resources on our website, which are free to use. Um, however, over the pandemic, we've been developing things, and one of those is our Seahorse Biology, Ecology and Conservation course. Um, it costs £65, and it has 13 sessions in it, so you can learn all about the world of seahorses. Um, and following on from that, it, we also do a seahorse survey course, which teaches people about the methods that we use for surveying. Uh, we will probably be running one of those online 
and um, so that's more of a webinar based one and that's probably going to be in April so if you're interested do let us know but if you have children we've also been um, brought on board and been collaborating with the Great Outdoors um, and they have developed a seahorse activity bundle um, I have a little four-year-old and I've got to say it's great <laughs> because I managed to do a lot of the activities in the last um, uh, half term before Christmas um, and I'm going to be doing them again um, in the following half term. There's lots of different um, activities you can do on there. So please do have a look. Both of those um, bundles and the, um, the course, the majority of the money does come back to the trust. Um, if you're interested in supporting us, we have an adoption scheme. We also have a membership scheme. Um, so please do have a look um, and for any other information please have a look on our website and I hope um, that's a whistle stop tour of the Seahorse Trust and what we do but I hope you've really enjoyed it so um, thank you very much and I will stop sharing now. Thank you. That was incredible. Um, I never realised I didn't know so much about seahorses. It's actually amazing. Um, I'm just going to share some of the WordCloud stuff so we can go over um, what people have um, added to our WordCloud, just because there's no point doing it if we're not going to show it. Yeah. Um, so let's let's have a go, shall we? Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, sorry, I did waffle on for a bit longer than I was expecting. Oh, that's but... absolutely fine. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, here we are. So um, there we are. Hopefully you can see that. So this was um, what word comes to mind when you think of the seas around the UK. Obviously, you've got loads of polluted, cold, yeah. also beautiful. What I quite like is um, polluted and beautiful kind of have the same weighting, which means, yeah, it's, it's just quite nice. Um, fragile, diverse, crucial to the environment, um, tranquil, calming, which is quite nice. Yeah, we, we all know how great the environment could be on a mental health and um, the sea is no different to that. Um, yeah, obviously, we've got quite sad things like plastic. Um, polluted that kind of thing but um yeah lots of really interesting stuff there so i will just stop that screen share for a second while right I... no it's quite interesting that because i think at the moment don't get me wrong the oceans are in crisis they are in true crisis and i think that a lot of people are worried about it but they're seeing it as a too big a problem they can't deal with we can all do a little bit and the little bit we do makes a massive massive big difference so don't feel disheartened by what's currently going on Sorry, Dan. Uh, one. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, and yeah, here we are. So what threats do we have? So overfishing, pollution, climate change. Is there anything you want to add to that, Becky? Um, yeah, I think, you know, they, they are true. All those things are true. But we do forget about our own personal effect. So like the divers, the snorkelers, all those sorts of things. We do have to remember that it's sometimes it's cumulative. Um, and sometimes the recreational activities that we do as well also have quite an impact and we do need to think about those too. But yeah, that's really interesting. That's great. Awesome. Um, I believe uh, my manager, not just my colleague, my manager has uh, been collating some questions. The chat has been on fire, like so much has <laughs> come in. So Kieran, over to you, mate. Yeah, I've probably missed some. Um, I'm going to try and get through as many as possible in the short time we've got. So what I'm going to do is, First of all, there's there's um, a message from Cheza saying that th they're doing their second year foundation degree in a marine ecology and conservation and for their research project, they're doing a seahorses and public knowledge mm -hmm. survey. So they wanted to know if Seahorse Trust would share that. I was yeah. just going to suggest that they email you with more yeah. details. Yeah, please just email us, let us know more about it and then um, we'll help you in any way we can. Yeah, so I'm going to go through a few that I think you can answer quite quickly. So we'll do a bit of a quick fire. It's like a test. <laughs> No, yeah, how many different types of seahorses are there? That's oh, now that is debatable. It's quite interesting. Um, we use um, Sarah Lowry's book um, and her classification on seahorses. Depending on who you talk to, there are 45 species or 60 species. Okay. Um, but we go with Sarah Lowry. So that's an excellent book um, if you're interested. But yes, um, it's quite a debatable one, that one. So we'll move on from that, I think. And what that tells me, Becky, is that seahorses need more research, more attention, although not yeah, disturbing it, attention. It's to do with certain parts of the body as to whether right. people believe they are a different species or not. All right. Um, Ajit would like to know, is there any seahorses in the Southern Ocean, such as South Georgia and Antarctica? So how... How no, they don't go yeah. down as far as Antarctica, well, that we know of. Um, not sure how far, how low down they actually go that way. Um, I know they go, in our hemisphere, they go up quite high because we've got reports coming in at the moment from Norway. Um, so I'm not sure is the true answer. Um, I'm sure it'll probably tell me in this book 
but I haven't got time to read through. Do we have a temperature range that they like? They do, but it's quite strange because the, the seahorses we have here in the UK are larger than the ones that are found in the Mediterranean. So they, those species tend to be bigger and do better in colder water. So it's possible it could be the same in the Southern Hemisphere, but I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Okay, but I, I, we'll keep going with the quick fire. At what depths can they be found? Ah, now this is an interesting one. The ones that we have been researching here in the UK, we've discovered that they come and they're inshore from about April, March, April time to about September, October. Then they go from the inshore area because it's too stormy and it threatens them in terms of their being bad swimmers. So they actually migrate offshore. Um, and we know this because they've been discovered during winter trawls um, in some very strange places. Um, you might remember the map at the beginning, the Dogger Bank in the North Sea, there was a whole um, number of seahorses discovered there during the winter. Um, so we know that they are moving off there. So we don't 100% know, to be honest, it's more research that's needed. So yeah, so we don't know as much about that part of the no. life. Because well, we can't get tags small enough. <laughs> well, that's actually a question. How do you tag a seahorse? Ah, that's one of the what ones we used we to do was we used to put a little Floyd tag around the neck on a tiny bit of very um, stretchy elastic that we had tested for years in Aquaria. And then we stopped because we suddenly realized that you could actually identify individual seahorses by the patterns on their faces. They all have, and we have to do both sides of their face, um, but they all have individual spot patterns. Um, so every single seahorse has their own spot pattern. So we actually do it that way now. We map them um, by their profiles as individuals. Uh, face recognition. Yeah, basically. basically. We can actually use face recognition on seahorses. That's amazing. That's fascinating. Um, Karen would like to know, is it the male or the female that changes colour, or are they both able to? They both, yeah, both can do it. Right, um, there's a question here. I think, I'm not sure whether it's UK or worldwide. So I think I'll ask, for the UK species, how long do they live? And then what is the maximum age that they would live? Well? I see this is another debatable one. And um, the reason being that we don't have enough research um, data wise in terms of life history from one year to the next. Um, and we're still collating it. So in Aquaria, it can be, I think, um, the UK ones generally between six to eight years. Um, but that 30 centimetre seahorse that was discovered was quite an old one because they grow every single year. So it was really old. Um, so we honestly don't know and we need more data on it. Uh, again, you know, data that comes in helps to sort of work out those patterns. We don't truly know. Um, if you do buy a copy of this book, you'll notice there's nothing about ages in it. And that's because we just don't know. No, I feel, I feel your pain. Uh, being, with earthworms being my topic, I get asked loads of questions. <laughs> Quite often I'm saying, I don't know if I don't know or if nobody knows this one. Um, so one thing hopefully we do know is with the males, how old are they before they're sexually mature and they can give birth for the first time? That changes with species. Um, so I think some of them is about two to three years, uh, but I could have that a little bit wrong. It depends on the species. OK, so I mean, that, that's that's a fair amount of time for an animal of that size, isn't it, to to become sexually mature? So. Yeah, right. Okay. How long is the breeding season and how many times? I, I guess this is going to be another one of those. We're not oh, quite, one of those ones. How well, many times um, they can give birth in one breeding season? We, I think I have this right. I may have it slightly wrong. Um, but I know that we had one male, who, bless him, just kept getting pregnant. <laughs> and we had him, we definitely had him three times, possibly four. But basically every single time we saw him, he got pregnant again. Um, and they will do, they'll they'll give birth and within 24, 48 hours, they're pregnant again. And they'll just keep going and going and going. Um, so some species like ours who have a breeding season, they'll just breed in that time that they're in the inshore coastal waters. So um, March through to September, October. But the, um, the ones that we know that are polygamous, they could, theoretically just keep going and going and going and going and going because they don't have a breeding season. I could make a comment about this is why males shouldn't be the ones that get pregnant but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of have. Uh, how long is the gestation period for the males? That's from Sarah. Um, it, again it depends on the species um, but I think those in the UK um, are about oh, I want to say 28 days 
but I could have that wrong. I think it's about 28 days. Okay. So yeah, fa fairly fast, fairly fast. Um, any more quick ones? I think so. Are seahorses carnivorous at all? Will they eat the young from others? I believe that there have been um, cases when that's been noticed um, that they will, um, because they're about the same size as the shrimp that they eat when they're born. Um, I believe that has happened, but I don't think they intentionally go to eat um, other seahorses. Well, this is great. We've never got through this many questions before, Becky. <laughs> um, so, right, so I've left out the most difficult ones. So, so I'm going to ask one from Sandy, because uh, you talked a lot about the eco moorings and they seem absolutely fantastic. Uh, Sandy wondered, how much does a single eco mooring cost to build and deploy? It's about two and a half thousand pounds for um, one. So yes, it's, and how does that compare? I'm adding a question in here just for context. How does that compare to a non-eco mooring? Um, it's probably a lot more expensive, to be honest, because a non-eco one, you generally, um, if it were me, um, it would be a concrete block, um, a length of chain that obviously can support whatever vessel you're going to put on it, because whatever has goes on has to be um, the chain or whatever you put on has to be strong enough to take the weight of whatever vessel you're putting on. Um, so then the chain and then the floats. So it is probably cheaper. It depends on what you are going to do with that mooring if you, depending on what you're going to put on it, to be honest. If you're only putting a little dinghy on it, then it would be a lot cheaper to do it the old way. Um, but if it's a bigger vessel, then you want to spend your money to and make sure your vessel is more, safe. The more we can encourage this to be a standard. Yes. Yeah, it is. It does seem to be becoming a standard. Um, I think Falmouth Marina puts them in as well. Um, so it's a lot of marinas are now looking at this as a new way forward. Brilliant. Right. OK, there was another question I wanted to ask. So Mary, um, I think rightly so, was horrified by the, the dry seahorses being an issue. And she's asked, why would CITES actually certify the dried seahorse purchases? Um, so. I guess the question is, you said you'd need a CITES licence, but would you get a CITES licence for that purpose? It would have to be a species that's currently not considered to be threatened or endangered. Um, and to be honest, there's ver it's, I don't really know of any species with a, of seahorses where we have got, it's, it's difficult because CITES base things on um, population estimates as to how they're doing. Some seahorses, there are hundreds of them. Others, not so much, so much smaller populations. So they base whether or not a population can be, can be taken from sustainably or not. Um, I'm not 100% on that, how it actually works for seahorses, but I know that some species, a certain proportion is allowed, um, but I don't know which species. And <laughs> nothing in the uk no oh yeah. no you, can, so, you can't take them here at all um but it's um you, if you have a permit it's for any you know anything that is that is banned um there's three different layers to societies in terms of appendices as to ones you cannot trade them at all ones you can trade a little bit and ones which are being monitored um, and it depends all upon how um, the population has been um estimated assessed and for a lot of a lot of species are what we call data deficient and that's a bit of an issue because we don't actually know what the situation is at all because we haven't got the data to deal with it yeah um so in your present this is a question for me now i'm being selfish in your presentation you said how the key to stopping this is um education but i wondered when I have my holiday in Devon and I go, I go to Brixham or I go to, I go to somewhere along the, the Devon coast and I see a shop that's selling these, mm -hmm. what is it that I should do individually? Because obviously there's no point having a big argument with the No, shop. there's certainly no point um, even bringing it up with the shop um, keepers, to be honest. Um, what we ask is whatever it is. Um, please get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch with our team. We have a team of volunteers who deal with specifically with this mm -hmm. and they have a direct connect to the police or you report it to the police. The reason why we say if you do it through us, it goes to the right people, because um, as you'll know, police, like every organisation, have their own dedicated roles. And within each um, area team, there is a dedicated wildlife officer 
and it's that person that we have contact with. Um, so that's the person. If you did see it wherever you are and you wanted to report it yourself, you need to report it to the local wildlife crime officer. Yeah, and that 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 goes for anything really, doesn't it? Yeah. Wildlife crime can often be dismissed as not being important otherwise. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Right, we are running out of time, so I'm going to look for a burning question. Um, while we do that, um, we had a question about the book that you had. Um, oh, yes. Is the title and the author is, is the it's, Sarah Lowry one? It's Sarah Lowry, yep. uh, Seahorses, a life-size guide to every species. Oh, that's awesome. I'll whack that in there as well. So all the ISBN is in there as well. That's so, great, thank you. Yeah, so there was, there was a number of questions about seagrasses. Mm -hmm. So I think if we just think a little bit outside of just seahorses, can you tell us if there are any other, if there are any initiatives nationwide or Scotland or, or Wales or England or Northern Ireland, et cetera, that are focusing on protecting seagrasses that, that might also benefit seahorse populations? Yeah, no, there's, there's loads. I've got to say seagrass restoration at the minute is fantastic. The UK are just absolutely hitting it. Um, we've got so many different groups. There's Project Seagrass, um, who are really, really busy. They've got a, a site at Dale, um, and I think they're setting up another site. They've been supporting um, the Craignish Community Collective with theirs up in Scotland. And um, there's the Ocean Conservation Trust. They do lots of things as well. Um, there's been the um, Seagrass Restoration books recently been released. There's loads and loads of seagrass projects. And if you are interested in getting involved, just get involved in any of them. It's fantastic. The other one that's local to you, please do, because it's brilliant. And there's um, there's all sorts of restoration going on in the UK at the moment. There's seagrasses, there's kelp beds, there's Pacific oysters. It's really incredible at the moment. It's, it's very enthusiastic. It's great. Yeah, we, we actually had one of these Natural History Live talks on seagrasses. So if you, well, you, had, had, the, you had the Remedies Project, didn't you? They're great too. Yeah. So, yeah, so have a look on our YouTube channel, uh, subscribe. And if you look through our previous talks, you'll see uh, you'll see one on seagrasses. And um, we've got a few other marine ones as well. Um, so we are at one o'clock. Oh, no, we're not at one o'clock. My computer, the clock's wrong. We're at two <laughs> o'clock. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to Becky for a fantastic talk. Oh, 